So we're ending our series today. We've been spending several weeks in the book of Acts. And I wish we could keep going because it's really just a, a powerful, great, 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 great book. It's very important to understand it's called the book of Acts. It's not the book of thoughts. It's not the book of intentions. It's not the book of spirituality. It's not the book of spiritual feelings. It's not the book of beliefs. It's the book of Acts. It is a book that is meant to get you moving. This thing, as good as it may look to the uh, eye of the person who likes who like power mechanics in high school, I don't think they have power mechanic classes anymore. So, so sorry. One of the many things that are broken in America. Bring back shop class. Bring back power mechanics. Where was I going? Where was I going? I'm sorry. Sorry, getting off in a rant. I'm, I'm getting more excited about power mechanics than I am about Jesus. That's probably... Not a good idea. No, it is. One of, the, one of the things about this thing that's meant, it's meant to move. It's, it's meant to go someplace. I hope you came in here today, and we're going to give you thoughts. We're going to give you some things that you can believe. We're going to give you some things you may intend, but make no mistake about it. You're here today so that outside of here, you move. You get going in a new direction. You start moving someplace in your life. I can't talk about the book of Acts without the most pivotal figure in the book of Acts, who is? I told you last week, Jesus is always the answer. <laughs> Jesus is always the answer. I don't know. Well, Jesus, in, in church, Jesus is always the answer. But if you didn't say Jesus, it would have been Paul. Yes, we're going to look at Paul. Paul, also known as Saul. Saul was his basically his Hebrew name. He comes to know Jesus and he takes on his Greek iteration of his name, which is Paul. So Paul, Saul, same thing. And I was thinking about this, preparing for this. I don't think that I've ever given a talk on his life and his conversion in 28 years. Long, long overdue. So, so this is a first. Let's, uh, let's read it here. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Here's what it says. But Saul, who is also known as Paul, Still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if, if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Saul slash Paul is a, uh, he's a, he's a hero amongst Judaism. He is a Jew of Jews. He... Uh, he has the entire Old Testament memorized, all of it. He uh, does things that other people aren't willing to do. He is very, very devoted to his religion. So devoted that when this rabbi comes along saying that he's actually the Messiah, he's the Savior that's been prophesied about, that's Jesus. And then when he goes away, when he gets crucified and goes away, all of these people who are following him, their movement gets very, very powerful. I, I heard a, an enlightened intellectual from a college, college university say on PBS some time ago, whenever there's a special on PBS or something like that, not that anyone watches PBS or NBC or CBS or ABC any longer, but back in my day, we used to watch something and it had commercials, except for PBS. It was the only good thing about PBS back then. No, there was a lot of good things about it. It was wonderful. But they had, they, they never, when they would do series on Jesus, it was never, and here's what the Bible says Jesus is, so that's who he is. It was always find some enlightened person out there that could make you doubt the Bible. And one of these people I remember said, there, he said, Jesus figures or Messiah or Christ figures were a dime a dozen in the first century. And he's right, there were a lot of them. And you don't know any of their names. <laughs> And he probably didn't even know many of their names either. Why is that? It's because when that person died, they weren't God. They died. There was nothing there. But when Jesus dies, as we looked at this, he dies and Holy Spirit comes inside of people and starts empowering people. As people are empowered and the movement of God moves on, I mean, Jesus' words only build steam because the ghost, the Holy Spirit comes in people, starts moving. Paul and established Judaism and threatened, and Paul is going around killing people. He's overseeing the prosecution of people. He was present when the very first martyr is stoned to death, which is, which is, uh, which is Stephen. And 
That's what's going on here. Let's keep going here. Verse 3. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. God starts to talk to him, becomes blind, knocked down the ground, and he, as he's hearing these voices from heaven, he says, Lord, Lord, he knows this is God. Lord, Lord, he assumes this is God. Uh, the other people with them, they're not seeing anything. They're not being knocked on the ground, but they're hearing this voice that's audible. And Jesus says, stop persecuting me. Now, is it Jesus speaking? Uh, yes, we just believe the Bible. It says Jesus speaks. Yes, yes. But I think another way to look at this, too, is one time Jesus is asked who you are. And Jesus says, whenever you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. So when Jesus is here, the Father is here. When Jesus speaks, Holy Spirit speaks. Holy Ghost speaks. I believe it's probably most technically accurate that the voice is being generated by the Spirit because the divine presence on the world that's at work is the Holy Ghost, not the presence of Jesus. He's in heaven. He's resurrected. The presence of God here on this earth, what's happening, is the ghost. So when we say, God, I heard Jesus, I sense Jesus saying, we're really sensing the operation of Holy Spirit. And when you're in that operation... When you're going that direction, you are Jesus. You are. Jesus isn't here physically. He isn't here. But you and I are here. We're his hands and his feet. That's why, that's why Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Because when someone comes down on you, Jesus takes a person. Wait, but my spirit's in that person. Really deep and really important to understand on that. Now, what Paul is to undergo is a word that's a dirty word. It's a four-letter word. Actually, not four letters. It's about eight. Ten, by ten letter word. It's a, it's a word we don't like anymore. It's a dirty, maybe the dirtiest word today. And the dirt word is conversion. Conversion. He becomes a convert. Oh, I don't want to make it converts. We don't, we don't like this today. In our, in our world, like, no, 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 we're all good. None of us really need converted. What some believes, let them believe. No one needs convert. And, and me, I, some of us. Might be, might be saying, I, I was never converted. Those who, who would say that I'm a believer. So I, I was never converted. Really converted. I always knew God. Oh, jeez. <laughs> no, no, you didn't always know God. No, no, no. You might have always been brought up around God. God might have been present in your life to some degree. But there's a place, and the scripture is very clear, where we are converted. We are, we are moved. This is Saul's conversion story. He has the entire Old Testament memorized. He keeps all the laws as best as anybody can. What I love when I'm working on this, this Jeep, I bought this. I bought this Jeep because I've, it's the exact same year and exact same kind, exact same engine that I had in college. I had a 1978 Jeep CJ7, and uh, I fell in love with Jeeps. In large part because their advertising was amazing. I graduated from high school in 1983. This is the 1983 ad for a Jeep. The thrill of the wild. One vehicle captures that feeling with the strength and agility to master most any terrain. Nothing stands in its way. Jeep CJ, like nothing you've ever driven. There's a feeling you can get only in a Jeep. Oh, God bless America, man. Oh, that, man, that was back in the old school days when you used to watch TV and they had this thing called advertisements would pop up like every 10 minutes, like, oh, not again. But then when that thing rolled, like, oh, man. Man, that was, that was back when America uh, was awesome. When you could ride a buffalo without a helmet. <laughs> Riding a buffalo without a helmet. It's a blonde, you're grabbing and pulling her beside you. You see, you can't do those things these days. Can't do that thing. Oh, it's, it was great. Captured my imagination. 
listen, listen to the marketing material for the Jeep brand. Check this out. Check this. The Jeep brand has been indelibly linked to freedom, adventure, authenticity, and passion. Our core values are embodied in every Jeep brand vehicle's DNA. Throughout our storied history, Jeep brand vehicle owners have learned that go anywhere, do anything is a way of life. Not just a slogan. The Jeep badge stands for more than a brand. In truth, it's a badge of honor. Yeah, wow. Wow. Now, ch check this out. That's very inspiring. Now, check this out. Watch out what, when I re replace... Sounds cheesy, but just hang on me. Replace Jeep with Jesus. Here we go. Well, listen to this. Jesus has been indelibly linked to freedom, adventure, authenticity, and passion. His core values are embodied in every Christian's DNA. Throughout their storied history, Christians have learned that going anywhere and doing anything that Jesus tells them to is a way of life, not just a slogan. The Christian badge stands for more than a brand. In truth, it's a brand of honor. Oh, man. I'd tell you what we need to do. We need to get a, a, a brand campaign going for Jesus with Jesus riding a buffalo. That's what we need. Jesus riding a buffalo without a helmet. That would be great. Now, Paul, Paul, he got converted. Back to Paul. Enough Jeeps. We'll, go, we'll get to Jeeps. Paul got converted. This Jeep, this Jeep had zero help unless I came along. It was parked for 10 years. Frame was rotted out entirely. Engine hadn't been run for how long. Engine was shot. My hands have been over every inch of this. The, the, the frame has been re-welded by me and some friends at Crossroads. They've become my friends through the project. Every, every lifter, every crankshaft, of which is only one, every piston, every, everything is, my hands have been on it, reinstalling it, getting it done. In the, every gear, every synchro gear, every drive shaft, which I realize is now put on backwards. Every, every, every everything I've had my hands on. And here's the thing. This Jeep has no hope unless somebody converts it from a rust bucket to being useful. The Bible teaches that you and I have no hope unless we get converted. Converted to being about myself, for myself, being in the family of God. See, many of us... We don't identify the Apostle Paul's story because we, we really believe that we came to God. He just gave us a new coat of wax. He just kind of polished me up a little bit. Now, before we come, we, we, are, we are broken. We are broken. We are, we, we, are, we, are, we are immobile. We're not going the places we can go. We're not doing the things that we're actually designed to do. One of the things I'm going to do this summer is a bunch of reflection and reading on uh, reformations, revivals, and awakenings. There's different things about all three of those. And I'll talk more about this weeks and months ahead. But basically, I hear a lot of people talk about revival, revival, revival. Revival is great. Revival is wonderful. Revival, I, I want to get revived. All of us do. Revival is when like something happens inside of me and whew, I'm, I'm revived. My faith becomes fresh. In many ways, we want to offer hopefully some sort of revival every week and we want to try to revive our spirits and get us kind of juiced up to go about the world and the life that God has for us. But revival Revival is great, but what I really want is awakening. It's a massive difference. Revivals are about people who already have faith just trying to bring them back to life, and that's great. That's good. But what, what's happening here at Crossroads, and really what I want, is I want an awakening. What about the people who need converted? We've actually had an awakening happening here in our church. We've, uh, we've had over 2,000 people baptized in the last 12 months. Are you freaking kidding me? That is unbelievable. Wow. America's had a couple different awakenings. Two great awakenings, actually, where the Spirit of God swept over our country and people started coming to Christ who had no church background. Interestingly enough, every time it happened, it happens in tents. Okay, I could go into deep teaching, I'm going to stop. I'm not, a, a, a later teaching later on. What I'm saying here, though, all I say is Paul didn't get revived. He had an awakening. He had a conversion. This is hope for you. Maybe you came in here today 
knowing that there, there's a better future for you, but you, you need something more. You need to be awakened. We need to be revived. What happens with that? What happens is we move, one move is we move towards Christ. This is what Paul does. In Acts 9, verse 10, uh, once he's blinded, he, they lead him away to some place from to kind of heal up. He, he's, his eyes are open, but he's got like flakes on his eyes. He can't see. God comes and gives another person an assignment to go to the Apostle Paul. Well, not the Apostle Paul then. He saw later on he'll be, who will be the Apostle Paul, will be responsible for penning more of the New Testament than any other person. Here's what it says in 9 verse 10. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am. Ananias is just a normal dude. He's known as a disciple. Wasn't one of the original 12 disciples. Anybody who gets teaching from Jesus, comes under his teaching for the purpose of moving, is a disciple. This isn't to be confused with the high priest Ananias, also not to be confused with Ananias and Sapphira, also in the book of Acts, who sell a piece of property and they get struck down dead. Not because they didn't give it all, but because they said they gave it all. They lied. All they needed to do to be on God's good grace to return a tithe, 10%. But they said, they were, hey, aren't we cool? We gave it all. And they didn't. They got struck down dead for their lie. Not that Ananias. It's just another normal dude. And he decides to go and see this guy, and he doesn't like it. He doesn't like this assignment. Let's read it, 913. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. He's heard about the stoning of Stephen and how, how many people are having prison sentences and death because of him. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Ananias is going... Wait a minute, I can get bound if I'm going to him. But he had already before, if you remember that verse, he already said, here I am, Lord. Key change in your life. As you stand up and you get converted and you start going to Christ, you go, here I am, God, here I am. What do you want? What do you want? Where do you need me to go? Not what do I want to do. What do you want me to do? Where do we go? And whenever I see somebody moving in the direction of Christ with their actions, it's inspiring. This last week, I had a... Uh, I had an uh, event. Lib and I, uh, our, uh, we need a new washer and dryer. Uh, it, it broke on us, so we haven't wa washed clothes for 10 days. Finally comes delivered. Uh, I'll, I'll mention the company, even though I'm not getting any money from them. Home Depot, they delivers it, deliver the thing. Just make the story uh, flow easier. So Home Depot comes, delivers the stuff. And we're excited. Guys come in. They put them up. Sets up. All good, good. Truck goes down the driveway. Starts leaving. We go to put the first load in and turn the dial, and it doesn't work. It's stuck on delicate. It won't go to like normal or anything. I'm like, ah! No longer for 10 days. And then we're excited now this. I can't figure it out. So I get on the, the helpline with Home Depot. And I'm doing simultaneous texts. And I'm, I'm just representing the attitude of Christ as I was talking to these people. I was <laughs> patient and understanding and loving. No, I was not. I was not. I was a bit, I was a bit curt, like, hey, man, come over. I've been waiting for you guys. You've been delaying. You, you came over once. You said your truck was too big to get my driveway. You brought another one. I've been waiting. And now it doesn't work. So I'm going. We finally figure out it's not going to happen. They're going to reschedule for me. And here's, here's the text from the guy who I've been texting. It says this. Well, we'd love to hear how it went. I pray you have a blessed week, blessed rest of your week. That's code word for I understand God. I, I am for you, and I'm trying to move in his direction. That's what that guy's doing with his job right then. And I just had said, amen. Like, okay, you sent me like the little signal. You're trying to honor God. I, I should have. I thought about going, blessed. What does this mean? Like, <laughs> I'm curious if this guy knows how to share his faith with me, right? I think he did. Pretty cool. But that guy right there. He was moving, I believe he was moving in the direction of Christ. He was putting his heart in the line, putting his faith in the line. I don't know, does, does Home Depot actually have some sort of corporate policy that says you can't mention words of faith? I don't know. Maybe. Didn't matter. He was going to. He was engaging with his God that day in his actions. Ananias goes over, and he's doing his job much more high risk than the Home Depot representative was doing his job, yet he nonetheless, he does his job, and he goes to Saul, afraid of his life. This could be the last assignment he ever gets, because Saul's going to go, ha, you're one of those Christians. Thankful you came to me. I don't need to see to know I got gotcha, you, and now you die. Here's what happens. Ananias comes, and he says this, the Lord Jesus, 
who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. He is being filled with the Holy Spirit because he is going to have an assignment, Paul is, to take the words of Jesus to Gentiles. He has an assignment. Filling of the Holy Spirit in the the book of Acts, you go through it, it always is connected with somebody who is going someplace. Not with somebody who wants a new spiritual experience. Somebody, you might, it may be, give you a spiritual experience. It's wonderful, I love it. But the filling of the Holy Spirit is there to equip you to do, to act, to move, to move to Christ. And the Spirit here moved Paul to come to Christ to get converted. Converted. Not revived, because he was dead, converted. In the early days of Crossroads, it was actually started like this. There was 11 people who were having a Bible study, and they read the Bible, and they said, gosh, there's a lot of stuff in here that we're not experiencing in a lot of places. We should, just, we should get behind starting a church. We should find a senior pastor that knows how to start a church. And so that's how I came around. I came in and started Crossroads, but only because those 11 people started, and they said, we got to do something here. we got to move. And in those early days, we're meeting in a, in a middle school, people's middle school. It's since been torn down. People's middle school, public school, we're in there, and like people are coming out of every place. Auditorium's packed. It's a really exciting time. And we, back then, we had members, like official members. And then as the church grew and changed and shifted, just organization, we're always adjusting things for the best season the church is in. But way back when, we had these like congregational members. And so we said, we should have a new members class. So the first one was about six months after Crossroads had been going. And I think we, I don't know, 100, 200 people in this little room. And uh, front row, this guy in the front row, and he's real nervous. His, his, he's sitting there and his, his, knee, his leg is going. And he raised his hand on the Q&A time. And, he, and I said, yes. And his name is Paul. And Paul says, uh, or he, has, he has a bit of a, a stutter, a bit of a speech impediment. He says, are, are, you, are, you, are, are you saying that Jesus, Jesus is the only way? I was like, mm-hmm. And I basically, in a nice way, said, yes. And Paul and his wife, Courtney, got converted. They left their old worldview, their old way of life, that was bringing, not bringing them what they wanted, and they came to Christ. They moved to Christ, and Paul went on to be a very, very successful professor at the University of Cincinnati, and has moved on, and I'm telling a story, because he sent me an email last week that I was, it moved me to tears. He's moved on at a university. He was asking me to help pray for him because he was going to be, uh, he's the dean of students in the law department at a university, and he is, this is a picture he sent me of leading a Bible study with students, putting his faith out there, trying to convert someone. Have you ever had anything that's affected your life? Have you ever, like, had a brand of clothing, or have you ever tasted something, or did you ever have an awareness, and you realize it changed you, and you needed everybody, you needed to convert people? Again, I'm using this word intentionally because it's a hateful word. We don't like using this word, but it's exactly what happened to Paul. It's exactly what happened to me, and if you know Jesus, you know it's exactly what happened to you. And when you find something, you want other people to have it. And this is what happened with Ananias. This This is what's going on with Paul. And Courtney and their family, they're moving towards Christ. And as we move towards Christ, we actually move towards strength. Verse 19, Acts 9, 19. So Paul hears this word. Saul hears this word. It was Jesus who came to me. That's the first time he puts it together. It wasn't just God. It was Jesus that came to me. He's understanding Holy Spirit is what's happening in me now. Maybe the Holy Spirit's actually making me have these scales. Holy Spirit heals him. This is all processing. It says this, and taking food, he was strengthened. Probably wasn't eating much because he was so freaked out he was going to be blind for the rest of his life. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. And Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who, who lived in Damascus by proving 
that Jesus was the Christ, it's proving that Jesus was the Messiah, proving that Jesus was the Savior. See, the, the strength there, his physical strength increases with food. His spiritual strength increases with the Spirit wed with movement. Movement. I mean, I'm talking about, I'm talking about putting it on the line. Oh, my goodness. He has open carte blanche to go to all the synagogues because he's like a high, high, high holy guy. And he goes in. They're thinking he's coming here to let us know the latest strategy to how to find Christians and persecute them. But instead he goes in and says, oh, by the way, this Jesus, he is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He goes from being the persecutor to being the persecuted. He actually gets stoned. Not the kind you had last night. <laughs> the uncomfortable kind. And he knows it and he does it. Why? Because he has to move in the direction where Jesus is going because he knows this is where spiritual strength is. I think one of the reasons why we are, as a church, so anemic, and by, as a church, I'm talking about the holistic American church, which we're all part of if you're a Christian, not if you're part of Cross if you're a Christian. The holistic American church is that we, um, we don't move very well. We think a lot. We vote a lot. We theorize a lot. We spiritualize a lot, but generally, we don't move a lot. It's one of the things I, I think God loves about our church. Last week, again, 3,000 kids, oh, 3,100 last time I was given the number, 3,100 kids are fed and educated in Nicaragua now because of you moved. Great, great, great. That's, that's 30% of all of our attendance last weekend, which kind of bummed me out, not the 30%, but kind of bummed me out because I realized, gosh, we just hit the summer slump. It just it goes off a cliff in the summer. Next time, I'm going to do it like on Christmas Eve or Easter. <laughs> I'm not kidding around. Like all these CEOs, Christmas and Easter only. Yeah, great to have you. Give! <laughs> great to have you. Feed the poor! Great, you'll be in spiritual feed the poor. You know, I'm going to do that. That'll be fun. That'll be good stuff. Good stuff. But anyway, Compassion International is blown away. Like 15% is awesome. 30% is like unparalleled. That's, if you and your spouse took a child, that would count as 50%, not 100% of your family, as 50%. And we had thousands and thousands of kids that were already sponsored. I just think that's the heart of God, and I, so I love being part of you and love being part of our church. It's, it's fantastic. It's great. We move, and we move even when things are difficult. The Apostle Paul, Ananias, moved when things were difficult, when he was going to get persecuted. Saul, Paul, moved when he could get persecuted. He was going to go from being the persecutor to the persecuted. We are weak as, a as an American church because we don't move very well, and then we, we're not, we don't understand the dictionary. Like, I hear Christians today say that they're persecuted. They're not persecuted. You, you can't say that someone got elected who you don't like and call it persecution. You can't, you can't say a beer has an advertising campaign that you disagree with and call it persecution. You can't, you can't say that you, you can say you don't like it, say you want to vote a different way. No one is getting, until we start getting thrown in jail and beaten and thrown, rocks to us, and still somebody starts getting nailed to a cross, nobody's being persecuted. We're a bunch of weak, weenie boys and weenie girls. Oh, persecution. Oh, it's so hard to be in America. Oh, it's so hard to be a follower. Oh, please. Oh, please. Are you kidding me? My gosh. What did we think on top of that? Were we up for the call of Christ or were we up for the call of ease? Ananias isn't up for a call of ease. Ananias is up for the call of Christ. Paul isn't up for a life of ease. He's up for the call of Christ. And you have to figure out how much of the Spirit you want. Because the more the Spirit you get, the more you will go outside of yourself into areas of discomfort. The more you will put your faith on the line. Not the more annoying you'll be. No, you'll be able to be wise about it. But you're going to move. You're going to try to get engaged. Some of us are seekers, and we wear the seeker badge. Badge, seekers, we're see great. Here's the point of being a seeker. The point of being a seeker is so you can find. And you find so you can grab onto something and move. Some of us are like perpetual baby birds. We just have a... Why does a baby bird eat? A baby bird eats so it can fly away. 
It doesn't eat so hard. I love eating. I love kind of church. I love eating the high. I love it. I love it. We do it so we can move, so we can fly. What is the point of education? Shout out to all of our great teachers across us. Great teachers. All great teachers know. All good teachers know. The why, why, why do you need an education? I'm going to get real crass. Why do you need it? You need just enough education to Jesus. make them up. Jesus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Somebody hears what I'm saying. <laughs> you need just enough education to make money. Just enough education to get a job so that you make money. You ever met somebody who's in her 30s and has a PhD and hasn't had a job yet? It's a sad thing. Like, talk about Christ. They, they really thought that like, the point was to to just keep learning. Then eventually there's no, no more letters after your name. You're like, I guess I just got to go teach other people who don't know how to get a job too and just <laughs> hope that that's, that's the thing. So what Christians are, not P, all PhDs are, God loves PhDs. <laughs> that's, how, that's how many people in churches are right now. Want more learning. Cross isn't teaching me that. Well, gotta teach me. Let me tell you, this. you know enough right now. You know, as soon as there's something you know that you're not doing, God doesn't have to give you anything else. It's the book of Acts, not the book of thoughts, not the book of teachings, not the book of information, not the book of spiritual knowledge, the book of Acts. God wants you to act. He wants to move. Paul stayed with the disciples for a few days. He's like, hey, got it, got it, got it. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Someone's like, well, what's the next class on the one I can figure out? Well, why, why don't the crosses offer classes on? Where is it? I like classes, been to class. I like teaching you, part, big part of my job. I, I'm glad I do, I wanna teach, but just be really clear. It's so that we act. It's so that we move. It's so that we go someplace, move towards action. Acts 20, verse 22. Now behold, now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, Paul says, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await for me. He says, and I'm going. I'm going, I'm going to act, and I'm going, and it's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult. What is the point of knowing Christ, of the Spirit coming in us, if we're not going to do something about the Spirit? What is it? That's why that volunteering thing is so important to us. That Home Depot guy was volunteering his time, sharing his faith in a way. Paul is volunteering his time as he, as he, as he shares at his university in a in a, in a Bible study you can opt into if you want. We have people in our room, we have an inclusion room in our kids club place. Now, I'm, uh, sorry, I don't mean to be a trigger word for a political, it's not a political trigger word, but believe it or not, we at Crossroads, we want to include people. <laughs> yes, we want to include people, Includes we want to include children who have special needs. And they require high volunteer intensive work, like one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two. Uh, the size of our church, one of the good things about the size of our church, a lot of families of children with special needs can't go to church because their education system, their Sunday school, isn't equipped to have enough volunteers to, to build into them. It's one of the things that I love about our church. Why do those volunteers do that? Maybe they do because they see the potential in that child. Why do I volunteer at man camp and couples camp? I don't get paid for it. I don't get an honorarium fee for it. In fact, nobody in the band, no one's ever spoken at woman camp, man's camp, vet camp, man camp ever does. We volunteer our time there. Why would I do that? I would do that because, because for the same reason why someone might volunteer their time in a parking lot or in kids club. Because you say, maybe the next Mother Teresa's here. Billy Graham had a Sunday school teacher. Maybe, she, maybe I'm parking right now somebody who's going to come to know Christ and under the wisdom of God is going to cure cancer. We have that hope, and even if we don't, we move that way because that's what Jesus does. That's where he moves. Now, the point of this project, which has been wonderful for me, getting my hands in it, thinking about the ramifications of this, because I've thought many times, actually, it's great because every problem on this Jeep can be solved with the right information and the right amount of money. Every problem gets solved, and could solve, be solved really pretty quickly. I thought, man, Lord, I wish people were that simple. 
like my problems, your problems, it's not like the right fix in the right amount of money. It's, there, it's deep. But these things, no matter what it is, it can be fixed. But what's, what's the point of this if it is just a project to work on? Let me, uh, let me hook it up here just to make sure everything is good. We'll see. I've only started this thing. I was counting up earlier. I think six times I've only started. Let me make sure I've got my battery hooked up. I've got uh, my electronic ignition there. Where's my little star? Okay, I gotta come over here where the carburetor is. As beautiful as this looks right now, at least it does to me, because I understand what I'm looking at. Next step is I'm gonna get the body on and all that stuff. But I couldn't, I couldn't put the body on. I'm not dealing with a nice pain. I'm not doing that until I understand the guts of it work. All this goes. Just like us, God doesn't start dealing with the, you know, our fine theology or some of the stuff on our outward stuff until he knows, will this person move? Does this person have the capacity? It, it's kind of nerve-wracking just to make sure it does move. Let's see. That's satisfying. Oh, that's so satisfying. This vehicle is meant to move. Let me share with you the last verse in Acts. Last verse. Last verse. End of Paul's life. He's an old man. People are coming to him. Here's the, here's the very end of the book of Acts. Then uh, he, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and reaching, teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And that's it. It's like a really awkward end. Like, it shouldn't be like, with all boldness and without hindrance, the end. We're like, all boldness and all hindrance and all great glory to him who has been before all things and all throughout all things. Or all things and boldness and the move of God continued. On. But there's, there's no, it's like, it just stops. Why is that? Because the book of Acts is still being written right now. It's still being written right now, and I want to be in it. Do you want to be in it? Right now, in heaven, the book of Acts is still being written. Right now, the body of Christ is still moving. It's the greatest movement in the history of all that is. Every hospital that's ever come about in American history, at least anyone that hasn't come about in the last, before the last 50 years, all of them, we're by Christians. That's why I called Saint this or Saint that. Every, every orphanage. Because people said, well, I've, been, I've, I've, been, I've, I've been out in the cold and God adopted me. We need to have a heart for the children. Every, every relief organization I've ever known has been started. World Vision, uh, Compassion International, Feed the Children. All of them, all of them Christian roots. Public education. All believers who started because the awakening, one of the first American awakenings, went through America, and part of the outpouring of that is people wanted to read the Bible. And they said, hey, we need to like start teaching kids to read in a systematic way. Let's have a school that everybody can go to. We started education. If you look at the beginning of all the Ivy League schools, Yale, Princeton, Harvard, they were all started for pastors. They were pastors of divinity school. These are, this is in our heritage to say, are, I don't mean America now, I mean as Christians, to say you're meant to be on a movement. You are meant to act. You're not meant to think, you're not meant to believe, you're not meant to spiritually feel. You have all those things only to the degree that you move to be a part of the greatest endeavor that's ever happened on the earth that is the building of God's church. And how does it happen? It happens through acts of people like you and people like me that's how important you are to God. God, you are, you are good to include us, and you're good to be patient with us when we drop the ball. But Lord, we want to pick it up. You want to follow you any way we can, and we thank you. Thank you, God, for giving us this thing called the Spirit to take us to a new place. Thank you, God, for taking me to a new place. You're very, very kind. I thank you for it. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.